And finally, we're delving into the lands of MX Linux. I've been getting requests to cover MX Linux on the series since season one, and with the release of MX Linux 19.1, we're finally here. Now, MX is a rather unique Linux distro being based on Debian Stable instead of vanilla Ubuntu. As such, it comes with a lot of its own unique tools, such as this installer, and instead of reusing and rebranding tools from Ubuntu. MX Linux started sometime in 2016 as a sort of collaboration between the Mepiz community and another Linux distribution called Antix. Besides lots of custom tooling, one of the things that makes MX Linux unique is that it uses the old school sysv init system instead of the much more common and standard systemd. An interesting tidbit about MX Linux is that it's been at the top of distrowatch.com's ratings for quite some time. So let's dig in and see if MX Linux is as great as everyone seems to think it is. Now this is indeed MX Linux 19.1 Patito Fio running XFCE 4.14. The first thing we see upon logging in is this very Spartan welcome app. Now this thing is about as utilitarian as it gets with just icons that link back to apps or web pages that tell you how to do things. There's nothing really else to say about it. I mean, it's, it's gray. Next up, we'll ask DF about the install size and see that MX comes in at just about 5.2 gigabytes for a fresh install, which just might be the lightest weight distro in the series so far. Free is telling us that MX is using about 518 megabytes of memory, which is pretty good for an XFCE-based distro. Now when we look at HTOP, there is an interesting amount of CPU activity at idle. We're looking at just over 100 tasks and 136 threads. For comparison, OpenMandriva, which is the KDE distro that we just looked at in the previous episode, had just 67 tasks with 128 threads running. Now for having such a small install size, I was stunned at just how many apps MX Linux ships with. Like seriously, there's two of pretty much everything and a bunch of domain specific apps such as Geary, the IDE, like two different image burners and writers, and Midnight Commander, which is apparently making a comeback. And of course, there's a couple different media players. And to be honest with you, most of these applications felt old, like old school old. The whole of MX Linux has a very 2000s, like 2010 feel to it. There's even a couple tools for configuring dial-up networks. Now let's talk about backgrounds for a minute. This default background is the worst that I have ever seen. I think it's supposed to be a stylized X, as in the MX Linux logo, but it's just not good. The other backgrounds that it ships with are pretty good. Again, it has like an old school theme, like it's a very minimalistic, but it's a 2000s era minimalistic theme, and it's not, it's not good, but it's not bad. And I do want to point out that even though I changed the background here in this section, it reverted back to that old crummy one at some point, and I didn't notice. Now I had some challenges installing updates, possibly because there weren't very many since this is like a fresh install right after it was released. I managed to find a couple updates in the Synaptic package manager, but later while I was capturing footage, the little uh, tray icon appeared and I was able to install some updates normally from that. And a new section I'm adding into the script will look at inbuilt themes and custom tools, which most distros ship with nowadays anyway. MX Linux has a library of cool and custom tools for all sorts of things. Some of these tools are apps, while some of them are just scripts that do things. I actually appreciate having these sorts of control panels for one-off tools that can help you fix or tweak or otherwise just install things on your system. The tools themselves are pretty crude, harking back to that 2000s era again. Not a bad thing, really, but not something everybody will enjoy. Same goes for the style and theming. The first thing that you probably noticed was that the panel is inverted and on the left side of the screen. But the first thing I noticed was that the window titles, they are off-centered and to the left. If you didn't notice them at first, you certainly notice them now. That's an XFCE thing, by the way, and it's caused by the right side of the title bar having too many icons and controls, or decorations, I think is what they're called. Now, the left panel is kind of weird, and it's totally not my style. I know that lots of people like it, but it is not for me. If I had to use this panel, I would much prefer it at the bottom, similar to KDE, and MX supports that. There's also a number of themes, including some custom ones. Basically, you have white, dark, and darker. There's even a couple options to force dark themes on apps that don't respect the system theme, so that's cool. 
In the MX Tools app, there is an option to install the NVIDIA driver. And this is little more than just a script that installs the driver and the dependencies for it. It worked just fine, but the driver version it installed was 4.18, which is, it's pretty old. It's like a year or two old at this point. If ever you need to uninstall the driver, there is a script that it places in the home directory that you can run to uninstall it. Kind of weird, but okay. Now after installing the driver, I would normally run systemd analyze to get the boot times, but MX does not use systemd out of the box, so we won't be doing that. We will be having a look at NeoFetch though. We're running MX, like just MX apparently, with kernel version 4.19 and oldie. We're running 2091 packages on bash 5.0. This is XFCE obviously. We're using the arc dark theme with Greybird apparently. The icon set is the lovely Papyrus, but the terminal font is the ugly Liberation Mono, one of my least favorite font families. Next, we'll have a look at external drive support. We've got two different drives this time. The usual external SSD, which I've used in all of the previous episodes. It uses ext4 for the file system, and we also have an SD card running exfat plugged into an SD card reader. Thought this would be a cool addition to the regular tests. MX mounted and read each drive just fine, including that ext fat SD card, which is often a problem on some distros. I also included another set of tests looking at archive formats. We've got 7-zip, bzip, rar, and regular old zip format. MX Linux was somehow able to work with all of these archives out of the box. And granted, this is the first time, so maybe it's not that surprising, but usually RAR file support is not included because of, you know, it's proprietary and naughty and bad and all that other stuff. But MX had no problem with it. Now, in terms of codec support, MX Linux was able to open every single video format with no problem, and VLC used all of them, so it wasn't bouncing between all these different media players like some distributions do. The audio codecs were just fine, though the AUG file was the only file that opened with Clementine, the dedicated media library player. I find the codec support interesting because there is a tool in the MX Tool app to install more codecs. Maybe those are for like DRM and Blu-ray stuff? Now the third-party app support was a little dodgy. There's no snap support, obviously, but app images support was iffy, which is a big first in the series. When I tried to open Etcher from the terminal, it complained about this interesting little permission error on the temp file system. Never seen that one before. Now Flatpak support was iffy too. MX supports Flatpaks sort of out of the box, but the file manager doesn't recognize flatref files. That's annoying for people who download or share flatref files instead of using central repositories like Flathub. Now speaking of flat packs and repositories and things, I found installing apps a little weird on MX Linux. So first off, there's the MX Package Manager, which has a section of curated apps, which you can search through. I actually found most of the apps on the checklist on this little section. However, some apps did not show up here, and I had to use Synaptic or the trusty terminal. And Flatpak support is supported out of the box, but you have to go to the tab and enable it and get it all set up and everything. It's like everything worked fine, but it's just a little weird. Once again, it's that like 2000s disjointed feel. If this had been released in, say, 2008, it would be revolutionary, but this is 2020, and to be honest with you, this all feels a little tiresome. So even though MX Linux has tools for setting up dial-up connections, we won't be doing that here. Instead, we'll use the MX tool to set up Samba. Now this tool felt a little verbose, but it actually worked, and as you can see, I was able to discover MX on the network from my crusty old Windows laptop. Connecting to other machines via Samba and SSH worked great, though MX did not discover my Windows machine. I had to connect directly to it using SMB. And for printer support, it was just fine. My HP printer was detected and I was able to make changes to it without any root nonsense. Bluetooth was another success story. It connected perfectly right out of the box. It wasn't totally perfect though, and this is a good segue into the next section, gaming. Now I'm trying to play GTA here using the Bluetooth controller, and it's a mess. When I move forward, the camera pans up, and something I pressed caused it to start recording, I'm not even sure what. I played GTA on this controller via Bluetooth a few episodes ago, so I know it works. And then GTA just crashed, like midway through this. It complained about the DirectX renderer, so this probably has something to do with that old NVIDIA driver. But I was able to play it, 
The frame rates here are unacceptable and not enjoyable, and it is no doubt due to the drivers. Same story with the frame rates in Overwatch, which defaulted to practically the lowest possible settings and at 720p. It is dreadfully choppy, especially when you pan around with there being lots of detail. It's just not good. It's not good to look at, and I won't subject you to any more of it. And for the native Linux game, we're looking at 0 AD, a popular one, which ran flawlessly at whatever default settings it chose. There's not a ton happening here, so I wouldn't expect it to chug, but this is a 3D game running on old display drivers, so that's pretty cool. And lastly, we'll take a look at recording with OBS, which detected and defaulted to the InVenc recorder during the wizard. That's awesome. It recorded and played back just fine, no issues at all. So for the Geekbench 5 benchmarks, how do you think MX did? It's using a rather old kernel version, old display drivers, no system D. Well, MX 19.1 is the new CPU benchmark leader, safely dethroning Linux Mint 19.3 by healthy amounts on almost every single test. The Vulkan performance weren't impressive at all, and again, it's likely due to those old NVIDIA display drivers. So MX Linux was one of the very first Linux distros I was asked to review in the series. Am I impressed with it? No. The reason being is that MX Linux feels like what Linux should have been, or maybe could have been, in the mid-2000s. The styling is dated, the apps are dated, nothing about it feels fresh, except for maybe the performance, but besides the responsiveness of XFCE, I didn't really notice anything special about MX's performance and my usage of it. I think a big contributor to my opinion of MX is that it is so overhyped. I see people on forums and even in comments of videos of mine drumming up how great MX Linux is. MX is not a new user's distro, like at all. There's multiple apps for everything, some apps aren't particularly good, the styling looks perhaps more dated than even Windows XP, and the gaming performance was just bad. So who does MX Linux appeal to? Power users, I guess. Folks that missed the old days of Linux back before SystemD was injected into everything and Ubuntu became the king of enterprise Linux land. MX Linux is just fine for those who like it, but please stop hyping it like it's the next best thing since sliced bread. Woo, that was the longest outro segment I've ever done on a series. If you liked this video and you'd like to see more like it, leave a like, comment, subscribe. If there's a distro you'd like me to look at, please do not tell me in the comments. Instead, head on over to the distro delves repo on GitHub and open an issue for it so I can keep track of it and so other people can see it and comment on it. Or if you'd like to see something added or changed in the distro delves checklist, you can open an issue for that or even better, submit a PR and get a conversation going. I appreciate all your support and thanks for watching.